Hi, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, congratulations on getting up early again. Um, so, in Albuquerque last year, I gave an overview of the Spinnaker project. Um, my talk today is entitled Spinnaker Update. Um, I'm going to give a quick um, overview, repeating some of what I said last year uh, for those here who uh, weren't in Albuquerque last year. But then I'm going to uh, talk a little bit uh, uh, about an application um, of the Spinnaker system uh, that has some interesting features. So, um, firstly, just to acknowledge uh, the sponsors of the work, the construction of the Spinnaker system has been funded by the UK Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, EPSRC, and we have ongoing support through the European Union Human Brain Project and the European Research Council and the logos of, of, of various collaborators and industry partners are also shown on this slide. And I'd like to ac acknowledge their support. Okay, so Spinnaker, um, where does it come from? Well, when we put the first proposal in uh, to work on Spinnaker, which was around 2005, uh, we put two headline questions up that we wanted to answer. And my sense is that these questions have quite a strong convergence with the theme of this workshop. In fact, they have quite a strong convergence with the basic themes of the Human Brain Project. <clears throat> so we found um, slotting into HBP uh, a very natural thing to do. Uh, the first question is, you know, the, the information processing in the brain remains a mystery to science, but computers are getting more and more powerful can we use the kind of computing power which is available today to accelerate our understanding of brain function? Um, obviously, this would be a collaboration with, with neuroscientists and psychologists and others with similar interests. And then secondly, because basically we're computer engineers, um, can we use what we learn about the brain to work out how to build better computers, whatever that means, more efficient, uh, fault tolerant, and so on? Because we, you know, everybody in here who's a computer engineer knows that uh, the progress in, in Moore's law is bringing with it a set of problems um, to which we don't have ready-made solutions, but to which nature appears already to have discovered some solutions, if only we understood better how they worked. So these two questions resolved into this thing called the Spinnaker Project. Spinnaker is a sort of contraction of spiking neural network architecture, um, suggesting a machine that's inspired by what we do know about the internal workings of the brain. And our goal from the outset has been to put a million mobile phone processors into a computer uh, for brain modeling applications. We worked out at the beginning, um, even with a million mobile phone processors, we'd only get to about 1% of the scale of the human brain, and of course running very simplified models. Um, so we're still a long way off um, whole brain modeling. Um, <clears throat> but if you prefer, you can think of that as 10 whole mouse, 10, 10 whole mice brains. Um, we heard yesterday that they're about a thousand times smaller and, uh, um, and therefore my numbers from 10 years ago still look about right. Um, and, and you know, one obvious question is what, what's magic about a million processors? Uh, well, the answer from an engineering perspective is that it's uh, a big enough number that you have to worry about scalability from the outset. <clears throat> um, scalability can't come as an afterthought. And then you might say, well, why only a million? And uh, the answer there is fairly simple. We're trying to build this on an academic research budget. Um, and, and there are limits to what you can get away with in academic research. So we focused on this million because it's a nice big round number. Now to build a machine, you have to have principles uh, that guide your design decisions. Um, yeah, I, I used to work in designing asynchronous chips in the 90s and you know, asynchronous chips, it's really hard to get people in the wider world interested, but as soon as you start talking about brains, then everybody pays attention. And one benefit of this is we had a very nice article in The Economist in uh, 2015, and The Economist employs great cartoonists. Um, so this is The Economist uh, cartoonist, um, his perspective of neural engineering. Um, it's pretty accurate, I think. Um, you know, he's got the classic engineer hanging out tongue uh, posture right. I think we do that a lot. And, uh, 
You know, the idea that if it doesn't work at first, what you need is a bigger hammer, that's fundamental engineering. Um, anyway, so, so uh, the design principles were, firstly, um, we were aware that in the brain there are very diverse network structures in different brain regions, and uh, we didn't want to have to rewire a machine uh, every time we wanted to model a different region, and so we did the standard computer science thing of virtualizing the topology. So the machine has a particular topology, it's a 2D mesh, but you can map any neural topology onto the machine, and, and we provide the technology for doing that. Secondly, it's a massively parallel machine, and the thing that kills parallel computation is synchronization, so we don't do it. Um, the machine supports a, a model of computation known as bounded asynchrony. Um, basically, every, each of the million processes in the system keeps its own view of real time. Things happen when they happen, um, and the processor's job is just to cope with whatever happens when it happens. And, and so in the machine, which, which from the outset we've had this goal of, of, of building it to run in biological real time, so at the same speed as biology, um, we have the simple concept that time models itself. And thirdly, it's a, a more engineering orientation, but this is a big machine. Uh, big machines tend to burn power, and therefore uh, the machine has been engineered to be as frugal with its use of energy as possible. Um, my view of computing is that processes are free, at least if you buy them from the right source. Um, and the real cost of computation is energy, right? Um, and this is increasingly true right the way from, from mobile phones to supercomputers, that, that energy is the primary consideration. Uh, the silicon is relatively cheap in comparison. So I, I guess most people kind of know what Spinnaker looks like. Um, I've already said it's a 2D mesh. Uh, each node in the mesh has two chips in it, one that we designed and a standard memory chip, um, and then these are coupled in a mesh which here I've drawn as a, as a square mesh, but actually it's more symmetrical if you draw it as a hexagonal or triangular mesh. And each node is one of these Spinnaker packages. Um, <clears throat> the chip itself has 18 ARM cores on. Again, this is a number Y18. Well, you know, it's the number that fits on a piece of silicon that's reasonably economic to manufacture. Um, we fold it inside the package with the memory die. Um, so it's a single package with, with two chips in, sort of two and a half D packaging. Um, it's simply connected using gold wire bonding, so there's no complicated through silicon wires or anything, it's just wire bonded internally. Uh, but then this is molded together into the attractive plastic package uh, with the sale logo uh, linking to the name. And, you know, we spent the first five years of the project just designing this square centimeter. Um, that took about 40 man years of, of effort. Uh, one of my claims for chip design is you get more PhDs to the square millimeter than in most subjects, <clears throat> which is obviously an important research quality metric. Um, if we look in, inside the chip a bit more closely, um, the key features are highlighted here. Um, so the processors are pretty simple, ARM9, they're ARM968 cores, they're, they're a 20-year-old design now, um, but really quite they're quite energy efficient on the scale of the range of ARM cores that are available. Their performance is modest, but that's okay, um, and they are in the light blue rectangle to the sort of to the right side just above the middle um, and and in Spinnaker the neural models and the synapse models are in software okay so <clears throat> we decided early on that the neuroscience community did not have a strong consensus as to what the correct neural model was or what the correct plasticity rule was and we decided the way to handle that uncertainty was to use software. So if you have a new neural model, um, you can code a little bit of real-time ARM code, and then you can have that model running on a million cores on Spinnaker very easily. Energy efficiency is about data movement. So above that little blue rectangle, <coughs> there are the green rectangles where the local memories reside. Each processor has 32 kilobytes of code space, the instruction memory, 
and 64 kilobytes of data. These numbers are fairly carefully constructed. They're small. This machine is not going to run Windows anytime soon. Um, and you know, when, when the typical modern day student comes in and says, what can you possibly do with 32 kilobytes of code space? Then all I have to do is get out my trusty BBC Micro from the 1980s, um, show them David Braben's elite program, which ran in the 12K below the graphics area. And that was a 3D color graphic intergalactic space transport game that ran in 12K. And so I said, that's what you can do in much less than 32 kilobytes. So learn from that. But the key thing here is that those memories are uh, about a millimeter away from the processor. And the most frequently used data is a millimeter away. Um, if you want a, a simple model of the energy required to perform a computation, it's the number of bits you have to move multiplied by the distance they move. So keeping distance small is uh, the first priority. The less frequently used data, which in Spinnaker is the much larger structures required to describe synaptic connections, that's in the uh, 128 megabyte DRAM, which is accessed through the orange port at the bottom left. So that's about 10 millimeters away. Um, up, up to this point, Spinnaker is just a conventional, massively parallel computer, okay? Nothing interesting has happened yet. The only thing is we've, we've built it out of mobile components rather than high-end processors. We've scaled everything down and kept it lightweight, but otherwise it's a conventional, massively parallel computer. The innovation in Spinnaker is in the red bit in the middle, which is how we connect these processors together. And this is very much tuned to the problem that we're trying to address. Um, Neural networks are usually modeled as static graphs. Occasionally, of course, if you want to model development or um, structural plasticity, you want some local rewiring. But the assumption in Spinnaker is that the graph that describes the problem is either static or at most slowly changing. And we map the problem graph in, onto our mesh uh, using routing tables. Um, we convert every neural spike into its own packet, and then we simply propagate this packet around the system um, using a packet switch fabric. Again, fairly standard, but we've made it very lightweight. We use basically packet switched address event representation. So the packet tells you which neuron spiked. It doesn't tell you anything about where that information is required. Uh, that information is all contained in the routing tables. And because neural networks are very highly connected, we use a multicast routing system. So a single packet coming from a single core can end up at 100,000 other cores. And we can guarantee to do that in a, in a small fraction of a millisecond uh, to maintain the biological real time. So the key innovation in, in Spinnaker is in the router. Now, the router is simple. I like simple. Um, and so on the top, top left of this picture, you can see a typical packet. Um, there's a 32-bit routing key. That's the address event representation code, the AER code. There's an 8-bit header, which does some housekeeping. And there's an optional payload. You can stick a 32-bit data payload on if you want. But typically, for spiking networks, you don't. So typically, we use a 40-bit packet. And when the packet arrives at the router, that 32-bit key is compared with a set of entries in a ternary content addressable memory, the ternary cam. The ternary bit means it has don't cares, so you can pattern match on any subset of the bits in that key. And if you find a match, then you can look up the route that that packet should take in a straightforward RAM. And what you get out is a 24-bit vector which has one bit for each of the six interchip links and one bit for each of the 18 local processors. And that packet can be directed to any or all of those, any subset of those. And that allows us to support routing as shown to the right here, um, where there are a couple of example routes. Uh, if you take uh, the, the red node at, what, at address 1.1, again, this is drawn square because it makes seeing the address space easier. Um, although it's more symmetric if you skew it all and make it triangular. But the uh, node 1.1, which is colored red towards the bottom, 
wants to send a spike to the three yellow nodes at 63, 73, and 64. I don't know if this is readable from where you are. Um, anyway, it's the three yellow nodes together at the right. And basically, that requires a table entry at the source, a table entry at the white node 41 to turn the packet um, in a different direction, and then table entries at the yellow target nodes. And because typical neural models root spikes by population rather than by individual neuron, the ternary nature of the CAM means that you can root all the packets in a population in that first red node um, to all the populations in the yellow nodes with single table entries at those three points. Now, clearly with a 32-bit key, um, a full table would need to be four gigabytes, or no, four giga entries, and that is infeasible, even on today's technology. Um, so the, one of the design questions is, how big should the table be? And the answer is, the table has 1,024 entries. Is this the right answer? Well, we don't yet know. Um, it's, uh, it's turning out to be good for quite a lot of problems, a bit of a constraint for some others. Um, but it's one of the parameters where, in engineering terms, you've kind of got to put your finger in the air and, and take a guess on something. Now, <clears throat> because we don't expect the target user community for Spinnaker, which is primarily the computational neuroscience community, um, to want to worry about how they configure routing tables and how they write real-time code to run on ARM cores, um, we have a stack of software which uh, does most of the work for you. So we accept a network description in um, a standard description language. Uh, our primary support, as Carl Heinz said yesterday, is for Pine, uh, which is a Python-based neural network description language. Uh, but we also have front-end support for Nengo, which is Chris Elias' language from Waterloo. Um, we can feed in a description in those languages and then basically our tools uh, grind those things down, um, work out how to map the problem onto the machine, and generate uh, the various binary files needed to execute the model. And so the binary image is constructed, and then that's loaded onto the machine. Now, as Thomas Nowotny um, quite rightly pointed out yesterday, these data structures can be quite big, and loading them onto the machine uh, can therefore be quite slow. Um, we, are, we have some plans to address this. One of the things we're planning to do is, is to um, do some of the generation of the, particularly the large synaptic weight structures actually on the machine rather than off the machine, so that all we have to load is a relatively small description. And then we'll expand that on the machine. Um, but that's uh, a solution which is close but yet to come. So basically, if you can describe your network in Pine and you don't use too many of the exotic features of Pine because we can't support uh, the complete language yet, um, then the tools will simply map it onto the machine and it will run. The execution model on the machine, again, is driven by um, our desire to keep the energy consumption down. So the natural state of any core on the machine is asleep in a low power mode, and it's then event driven. Um, so if the code for the machine is expressed in a number of event handlers, when an event happens, the core wakes up, does something, and goes back to sleep again. And the three typical things that happen are shown here. A packet arrives. This can happen any time from any place. Um, the core wakes up, puts the packet in a buffer, and goes back to sleep. Um, there's a dequeuing system that uses a DMA engine to transfer data from the large SDRAM into the local memory. Um, and that DMA generates an event when it completes. That wakes the processor up to do the synaptic processing. And then there's also a local time reference, which is typically a one millisecond timer tick. And this wakes the processor up to drive the ODE solvers forward another time step. And of course, these events can happen at any time and in any order. Um, and so there's a small real-time operating system sitting underneath this um, that allows these things to happen completely asynchronously 
and to resolve and to get the processor back to sleep as soon as possible. In terms of where we can get to, um, our goal has been to go for a million cores supporting a billion neurons. Um, and the scalability numbers are here. We can model up to 1,000 neurons per core. Our current software is running at about a quarter of that. We still have some um, work to do on the mapping efficiency. We have 18 cores per chip, 48 chips on a, a big board, 24 boards in a card frame, five card frames in a 19-inch cabinet, and 10 19-inch cabinets, and we're there, OK? Easy. Um, <clears throat> it does take a long time to assemble it. Uh, we have been building machines for, for several years. Um, the small board, uh, shown as 102, and, and Karl Heinz was quite right. What this, this numbering indicates is the 102 machine has 10 to the 2 cores, approximately. It actually has 72. Um, and that's enough to model a network of the scale of a pond snail. Now, in order to avoid really annoying my neuroscience colleagues, I, I point out this is the scale of network. It doesn't mean we can model a pond, scale, a pond snail brain, because there's lots of details that we don't capture and lots of details that are possibly unknown. Similarly, the 48 node board with 864 cores can model a network of about the scale um, of a small insect, a few hundred thousand neurons. Put 25 cards in a card frame and you're at 20,000 cores and frog scale. And then we can put 100,000 cores um, in a single 19 inch cabinet and that gets us to about mouse scale. You know, again, all these animal references are to indicate scale, they all come with a health warning. Otherwise, I get very badly told off by the neuroscientists. Um, and you saw this picture yesterday, I think at least twice. Um, we have now assembled the uh, five racks of, of Spinnaker boards. This is half a million cores. And this is our commitment to the Human Brain Project, is to put a half million core machine um, online and make it openly accessible uh, for anybody to use. So this machine is up and running. Later this month, uh, we have a workshop on the 22nd. I think the official launch has now moved back to March the 30th. But from the end of this month, um, anybody who wants access to this machine uh, will be able to get it uh, remotely over the internet. Now, I have no idea what anybody is going to do with half a million cores. Um, in one model that we're working on quite actively with Chris Eliasmith is his spawn model. Um, his spawn model takes um, a few percent of this machine. Okay? Um, we expect to have his spawn model running in real time. Currently, his spawn model runs on, on uh, quite a high-end desktop and takes two and a half to three hours for each second of real time. So that represents about a 10,000 times speed up. Um, so what we're trying to do here is basically remove the scale barrier to the size of network that computational neuroscientists want to think about and then see if that causes anything interesting to happen. We will be trying to cause interesting things to happen ourselves at the same time, but, but we're very interested in finding users who have appropriate challenges for this machine. Now, that's an overview of the machine. Um, what I said I'd do is say something about applications. And what I've decided to talk about, because I think it's quite interesting, um, is actually a small job I did myself. Okay? It's always dangerous when the prof starts trying to use the technology. This is, makes the students very nervous. Um, but I did this here. And this was basically building a network um, that solves Sudoku. It's very much inspired by work done by Wolfgang Mass's group earlier, um, where they built a, a stochastic network that uh, would solve hard Sudoku problems. Um, and one of my students picked up on this and mapped uh, that network onto Spinnaker and got it running. Uh, but then uh, he interrupted and, and, and work stopped on it. Uh, and I thought this was a nice thing to talk about, so I decided to pick it up and play with it myself. But I adopted a slightly different approach, which I'm going to tell you about. Um, and uh, does everybody in the rule, room know the rules of Sudoku? 
I tried this in China last November and got a completely blank response. <laughs> Nobody in the room had heard of Sudoku. Um, I guess that's not the problem here. Anyway, the quick reminder is Sudoku is, is uh, a puzzle on a nine by nine grid and you're usually given numbers in a subset of that grid and the puzzle is to find numbers to fit in all the other squares and the constraints are that you can't use the same digit between one and nine twice in a row, in a column, or in one of the three by three subsquares. So that's the constraint. You've just got to find a pattern such as the one you see here where the same digit does not occur twice in any row, column, or square. Now, I set about trying to describe a network to solve this from first principles. And um, I wanted to do this just using our standard tool flow. So I didn't want to do anything difficult. Um, and so I decided that looking at the balance on Spinnaker, um, a sensible approach was to use one neural population per cell, that population comprising nine subpopulations, each of 25 standard neuron types integrating fire with current exponential synapses. Um, so 225 neurons describing the nine possibilities in each cell. And because, again, from uh, Wolfgang Massey's um, example of solving this, you wanted a noisy network, and on Spinnaker, the easy way to add noise to the system is to simply couple a Poisson noise source, and that's another type of neuron. So for each of the standard neurons, you have a matching Poisson neuron that just generates noise. So that gives you a total of 81 cells times 225 times two, 36 and a half thousand neurons, okay? <coughs> Pick a number. Um, sometimes, and not always, but I'll come to that, uh, you apply some initial values, and I did this by simply connecting um, spike, Poisson spike source populations um, in reasonable numbers to the cells to drive the digit I wanted to initialize the cell to. And uh, if you look at the connections there, you get about 21,000 synapses. Then the interesting bit, which are the constraints. Now, now, in a sense, of course, Sudoku is not a terribly interesting problem because you can get an app for your smartphone and you can just point the camera to Sudoku problem and it'll give you the answer. Um, but it is quite a complex constraint problem. Um, I've been told it's quite similar to the traveling salesman. I haven't quite worked out how to map the traveling salesman in, into a similar format. but. Um, so it's, you know, it's quite a complex constraint problem. The nice thing about Sudoku is you get visual results, okay? So it's very easy to see what's happening. Um, and the way I implemented the network is I simply put inhibitory connections um, from each digit to all the other digits within a cell. So if the cell wants to be a five, it can't be a four or a three. And that's represented by inhibitory connections within a cell, and that gives you three and a half million synapses in the model I've described. And then likewise, to constrain, if you have a digit in one cell in a row, it inhibits the same digit in all the other cells, and likewise in the column and in the square, and that rapidly clocks up another nine million synapses. And so we have a model here that's got something like 13 million synapses. Um, it can all be described very simply in Python. Um, I admit to this being my first ever Python program. Um, it's 165 lines to describe this in Pine uh, to, in, a, in a form that you can then just feed to the machine. Now, in trying to understand what the network does, um, Michael Hopkins suggested I should look at a measure of network resolution um, based on entropy. And so um, I'm going to show you graphs. So I'm just trying to explain what's coming up in terms of graphs fairly soon. So the network, as I've described, it runs. Basically, I log every spike in the network for 30 seconds and get a big spike file out, which I then analyze. And in the analysis, um, I estimate the probability of a particular digit in a particular cell by counting spikes uh, across a time window normalizing those counts across the cell to get the most likely digit. And then I accumulate that value over time with a small decay so that 
I can use a fairly small time window, but uh, uh, the noise is sort of smoothed out by uh, accumulating the value. And then the current recommendation for the digit for that cell is just the digit with the highest probability, okay? That's fairly simple. Now the entropy is basically summing over the entire matrix, um, the sum of minus p log to the base 2p, where p is the probability, and over all digits in all cells, and that gives you the entropy of the network. And, and that has quite an interesting behavior. Um, the first sum you can do is you can say what's the maximum entropy this network can ever have. It's always good to scale your graphs. Um, and of course, the entropy is maximized when the probability of each digit in each cell is equal, i.e. 1 ninth. And so you just work out 81 times 9 times minus p to the log base 2p, where p is the ninth. And the answer, interestingly, is the maximum entropy is just over 256 bits. Um, and so you can see uh, how that works. And I'm just going to show you a, a number of runs and talk about them. Um, the coding I'm going to show you, um, where you see a digit is gray, that means it's been, um, it's an initial value, it's been stimulated externally, and it appears gray when it's correct. Because uh, even when it's stimulated, the most likely value may not be that stimulated value. Um, when it's shown as red, it's wrong. It's violating one of the constraints. When it's shown as green, the most probable number is consistent with the constraints. In other words, it doesn't clash with the same most probable digit in row, column, or square. And the other thing, which I'm not sure how well this will work on a projector, um, is that the brightness of the digit actually indicates the, the confidence of the network in the answer, the probability, okay? So that's what you're going to see, and you're going to see a set of things that look like this. Um, this is a typical network um, where the initial values are not, are not all placed on instantly at the start, they're, they're, they're placed on sequentially. I'm, this, this was a thought to try and solve an issue. I'm not sure it makes any difference. Um, what you're seeing on this slide is the Sudoku puzzle, which you can see is now solved. Everything's either gray or green. Um, if you look very closely, the green is getting brighter because the confidence in those results is increasing. Um, on the top left, you're seeing the entropy plot, and the dots there are red when the solution is not correct, and they turn blue when it's correct. So what you can see is uh, you know, a very nice, smooth drop of entropy in the network um, the solution emerges only, you know, about halfway down the curve. And then at the bottom, now at the bottom right, I have to explain this. Again, I was interested in, in the sort of analogy between what I'm doing here and a, a simulated annealing algorithm. Now, in simulated annealing, as you converge on a solution, you generally reduce the noise to cause the system to settle more strongly. Uh, the interesting thing here is, as the noise reduces at the right-hand side, uh, the entropy in the network starts to go up. Um, I haven't yet run this far enough to know if you turn the noise off, if the, th if the thing will actually come out of a solution. Uh, the thing at the bottom left is a complete raster plot of all 81 cells over the entire run. Um, it's, it's something I got strangely good at reading, but uh, probably needn't worry you with. Um, and so this is an example where the puzzle gets solved um, and there's only one parameter that's actually interesting in what I'm going to discuss. The, the, the whole network has got relatively few parameters, but this one up here is the noise parameter, which is controlling um, the degree of noise. Every, all the parameters are selected from distributions and are a bit sort of random, but um, this is the sort of mean noise parameter. And so I thought, well, I wonder what this network does if I don't give it any initial state. What will it do? So I did that, and even when I turned the noise down from 1.6 to 1.1, uh, the answer is nothing interesting happens. Um, the entropy stays maxed out. Uh, the rasters show everything's firing all the time, and nothing emerges from the picture. So that wasn't very interesting. However, if you turn the noise down a little bit more, then something interesting does happen. Um, so from going down from 1.1 to 1.0, there's no initial values here. It's just a network set up with the constraints. And what you see is the entropy sort of hangs around, but then suddenly starts going down. 
and a random Sudoku solution emerges. Okay, and it's a valid solution, it's all green, so there's no conflicts. Um, and because it wasn't given any initial condition, I kind of, you know, in rather loose language, describe this as dreaming a solution. Um, it's not been told anything. It just emerges. And I thought it was, it was fairly likely that if this network was set up right, that, you know, if it was given an initial condition, it would find a solution. If it wasn't given an initial condition, it would find a random solution. Um, it turns out, well, as currently set up, that doesn't happen. Because if I take that same noise level, which you, you, you saw, well, you've only seen a couple of samples, but I just reduced the noise until it produced a stable solution um, without any initial conditions. So I thought, well, what happens if I put the initial conditions back in? Um, and what happens here is the entropy goes down a long way, okay? Um, so you get to really quite a low entropy, but it, a solution does not emerge, and effectively, the network is getting stuck in some kind of local minimum because there isn't enough noise for it to find its way to a valid solution. Now, this is all sort of fairly preliminary work, okay? I'm, I, I haven't drawn any conclusions from this yet. Um, uh, and I'm still thinking about what, what this all might mean. Um, you can see in, in this failure, by the way, you can see the conflicts. Uh, because the, the conflicting numbers are red. So you can see three sixes over there with two conflicts and four sevens um, with each with a, just a conflicted pair. So um, <clears throat> where are we up to? Um, so the first thing I wanted to say is I did all this on the HBP portal. Okay, so this service that we're about to offer openly, um, we've been running internally for Human Brain Project members for, I think, about the last year. And that's all I use for this, okay? You might think this is odd. I run the Spinnaker Group. My lab is full of hardware. Um, but I was quite interested to see how difficult it was to do this kind of thing over the portal. And the answer is, at least in this case, it was extremely straightforward. Um, it takes about six minutes. Um, to set the, it, once the job's set up on the queue, it returns the results in about six minutes for a 30-second run. So again, similar to what you heard from Thomas yesterday, there's a fairly big overhead. There's five and a half minutes of doing some, something other than running the network, and that's something we hope to improve, but it's the current state. Um, it generates about 50 megabytes of spike data, which is what I copy back for analysis. I do the analysis locally. The analysis is very quick. Um, it has this mysterious property that you need higher noise to found a solution with inputs than you do to dream a solution without inputs. Um, now, <clears throat> my thought on this is that one has to be slightly careful uh, because the noise here is, is actually not unbiased noise, okay? Because the Poisson sources are all firing into ex excitatory inputs, um, the DC is not zero. So they're actually adding DC bias to the network as well as stochastic noise. And I, that, that may be part of the reason why um, we see this difference. Um, and this phenomenon that the network entropy increases if you reduce the noise that you, find, that you supply to it um, is something I'm still thinking about. Um, the kind of things I'm planning for the future, if I ever get any more seconds to work on it, um, is, is to think about how one might control the noise homeostatically so that you don't have to change the noise level for solving and dreaming. Um, and as a big challenge, it seems to me possible that one, you know, this network has the rules of Sudoku hardwired into it, okay? So it knows Sudoku, those are the constraints. It's possible to think about how you build a network that would actually infer the rules by being shown examples. I think it's quite tricky. Um, because the current rules are embedded as inhibitory cross-connections, I think to learn the rules, you'd have to flip those over to excitatory connections, and that would be quite a weaker way to represent the constraints. Um, but anyway, I, uh, this is sort of work in progress. So I just wanted to, to show this as the, you know, a kind of thing that's fairly easy. It's quite a big network. I believe one of my students has taken this network and tried to run it on Nest. 
um, which is you know standard desktop, and it nest breaks because it exceeds some number. Um, the number of connections exceeds some limit. Um, but I've I've simply run this on Spinnaker through the HPP portal with the standard tool set and um, never hit a problem. So I'm not sure this is a universal experience, but for this kind of model, which is non, it's, it's relatively straightforward in terms of what it's built from, um, but it's fairly large. And you know the the 13 million connections, it's running on about two to 300 ARM cores. Um, so it's only using a sort of handful of Spinnaker chips. But even so, the, all the routing and connections have to uh, work, and the traffic has to avoid congestion and so on. So I think we've got something that's beginning uh, to be useful. So <clears throat> just to wrap up, um, the Spinnaker machine itself has been 18 years in conception. Um, I remember when the set of ideas that are now in the machine um, started and when they came together. They came together, actually, out here in the valley when I was visiting Sun Labs. We've been constructing it for 10 years. Again, the magic 10 years. Um, all large-scale projects take 10 years, apparently. Um, but now we have the big machine. It's ready for action. Uh, we have got about 70 smaller boards out with groups around the world, so there are quite a lot of people tinkering with it. Um, we've built machines up to the half a million core, and we're still planning to extend this. We're still planning to double that up to a million, and that million core machine will still be available through the HBP portal. It's just that the half a million core machine is our contractual commitment to the European Commission. All right, so that's tick done. Uh, the million will come sort of at our leisure. Um, we're very interested in, in finding large models um, because all the models are represented in code. The models don't have to be neural networks, OK? Um, something to think about is, is if you can break your problem down into a very large number of really quite simple processes interconnected by a reasonably static graphic topology, we can probably run it. So there are people interested in running, um, well, Andreas Andrew at, at, at John Hopkins has run Bayesian networks on it. Um, people have run factor graphs on it. Um, all sort of related but, but non-neural models. Uh, now, our software support for that is not as extensive. Um, but th there are quite a lot of things you can do. And I'm very interested to see who can come up with models that use you know, anything like half a million cores, uh, you know, half a billion neurons. Have you got your half a billion neuron model ready yet? Um, the Human Brain Project is supporting the software development and, and the, the open access will arrive this month. Now, the graph on the right is from the Human Brain Project proposal and it's showing the sort of energy efficiency of different ways of brain modeling. The very biologically detailed models at the top running on a large supercomputer use about one, one joule per synaptic connection. The brain uses about 10 to the minus 14. Um, Spinnaker is about 10 to the minus 8 joules per synaptic connection. The analog neuromorphic system from Heidelberg is about two orders of magnitude better. Um, True North, I think, is probably about the same level as that. About, it's certainly um, orders of magnitude better than Spinnaker. Um, but what you see in this stack are kind of trade-offs of, um, of energy efficiency versus flexibility. And I think with Spinnaker, we occupy quite a nice niche because we have a lot of flexibility. Um, without, we don't have the best energy efficiency, but we have a usefully good energy efficiency um, with a very high degree of programmability. So I shall stop there. Just notice that uh, I didn't do this on my own. Uh, my team is not of the scale of the Allen Institute. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, and, you know, because the project's been running 10 years, waves of PhD students have come and gone. You know, there's several PhDs on the chip. There are several PhDs in the software that came later, um, and various postdocs and, and group members. And, and I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of all of these people. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, a couple 
Quick questions. You, you said that after every millisecond of ODE update, it goes back to sleep. But if you have neurons uh, that have dynamic, uh, you know, kinetic equations that are solved by ODEs, I would think that you'd be, all the neurons would need to update themselves every millisecond. So you couldn't go to sleep? Am I, am I missing a, a piece? Well, uh, um, each, each core is constrained by the number of compute cycles it has in each millisecond, okay? And it will send a, spend a certain number of those cycles computing ODEs. It'll spend a certain number of those cycles computing connections through synapses. Um, if you fill it, you, you've got to provision for a kind of worst case when lots of spikes arrive at once. So in the typical case, you don't use all those cycles in any millisecond. I see. So then you can shut yeah. it off for the balance of the millisecond. Yeah. So, the, so the t typically, the ODE solving takes about 20% of the cycles in each millisecond, and the synapses take 80% if you're running a model with a one millisecond time step. OK. Um, yeah. So, so you turn it off during that millisecond if you finished updating all your ODEs. Yeah. And have spare. Second question, uh, in your routing table, the 32-bit, uh, and I, 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 I followed a, uh, more or less that, the hashing scheme, uh, if you had neurons that were simulated in software on the target core with 100 dendritic branches, would your routing accommodate targeting the synapse to a particular branch of a great number? Of, I mean, I, um, or just, I wasn't clear how you sub-target once you get to the core. The sub-targeting is, is done by the core itself. Um, so in, in a typical simple model, a point neural model, where we don't have any dendritic structure, um, but we have sparse connectivity, if you think of the weight matrix where the, uh, the vertical axis is the number of different inputs and the horizontal axis is the number of different local neurons, uh, we do a fairly simple row compression on that. If, you know, if it's 10% connectivity, 90% of those values are zero. We don't represent those. We compress the rows. Uh -huh. um, if you want to do something more subtle, and you probably want to do something to do with dendritic um, uh, substructures, uh, I don't think anybody's done that yet, but um, there are ways to do that. In fact, one of my students currently has a rather different way of mapping the problems onto Spinnaker, which make uh, dendritic models in independent dendrites, very straightforward. Um, in principle, you can do it in software, uh, but it's a real-time system, so you better keep your software simple. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Uh, so I really enjoyed this. This is great. And um, so uh, most people should know here that this is a. Uh, I have no financial interest in this. This is a flash, uh, 256 gigabytes. Yeah. It has about 500 ARM cores in it right now, all hierarchically uh, arrayed. And an interesting thing would be to take the Spinnaker architecture and impress it into uh, standard memory units, which is available, I mean, today. So, so as long as Flash exists, which is only another couple, three or four years, okay, you will have all this uh, Unbelievable computation power in this thing, okay. the, uh, which is an interesting thing. So the other thing that I sort of disagree is is I don't see this as a traveling salesman problem. The Sudoku thing, okay. Yeah. Um, it may be NP complete. Did that? Is that what they said? Because it's not a it's it's not a correct uh, analysis of it. anyway. That's another story. So anyway, so this is an interesting uh, thing to think about. So I was chief technologist at Seagate. And uh, I believe we have somebody here who's also another expert in this stuff. And uh, think about putting uh, Spinnaker into little tiny boxes that don't require fans. Okay, it's, it's oh, and, and of course, that, that would go quite a long way to solving some of our I.O. issues. And I think, you, I think because, it really because will. Because basically, yeah. you'd, you'd, have, you'd not only have the execution, the runtime memory local to the processor, you'd have the storage memory reasonably local as well. So if you need some help uh, talking to these idiots uh, that do storage, okay, um, I can help. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for a very enjoyable talk. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, how many synaptic connections, uh, maybe on average or, or total, do you get per neuron? Uh, so the, the architecture is, is, is kind of aimed at um, neurons with 1,000 inputs, but it's not 
that's not a hard constraint. It's, it's a kind of performance number mm -hmm. we revolve around. Uh, in the Sudoku model, I think the number of connections per neuron is, is approaching that. It's 750 or something. Um, now, you can have many more. We, we're clearly aware that the typical uh, biological systems, yeah. people aim for 10,000 rather than 1,000. Um, all that you have to watch is the number of connections per second because each connection requires a number of CPU cycles. Okay, so, so if, your, if your connection matrix is deeper, then it's going to be narrower. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are some efficiency issues with making it too narrow. We, 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 this new execution model I referred to actually addresses that in quite an interesting way, but that's, that's not what's on the system at the moment. And have you ever hit any limit? Like, have you ever run a problem where this, uh, you've kind of run out of memory because you wanted to have more synapses, but you, you couldn't, or have you not really hit that limit? Um, I'm not aware of that. We, we, have, we, we, we have hit different limits, okay? So um, there's um, one of the models we're working with is quite a detailed cortical microcolumn model that, that developed at, at ULIC in Germany. Um, and that has a very diffuse connectivity pattern. And our, our connectivity is efficient when you can do the connections collectively. Mm -hmm. But if the connections become very sparse, then it, then, um, it loses efficiency. Um, now, we, we have got that model up and running now, but it's, it's actually taken quite a lot of work to work out how to do that. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Steve. So my question related to the noise and uh, noise control and the dream that that little yeah. part of the talk that you talk about, you use a Poisson noise. I was curious whether you have changed noise patterns, different kinds of noise, the Gaussian noise, and how would that impact your entropy as functional noise that, that you have this rise near the end? Uh, the answer is no, I haven't tried any other sort of noise source. I'm not sure we have a different noise source in the library. I, I mean, I can, I can ask that question, but... Uh, but most of the models that, that people want seem to use Poisson noise. Right. What would you uh, think that it might change under noise control, that, so, I so to speak? I have no idea. I suspect Wolfgang could probably make a better guess at that than I can. <laughs> I right, will talk about that. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Steve.